Hello, welcome to the Austin Parks Foundation's Park Summit Series. We're so happy you've joined us today. To learn more about the series or to view recordings of previous sessions, please visit www.austinparks.org slash parks summit. If you haven't already yet, uh, please subscribe to our newsletter for up-to-date information on the Summit Series and APF's other programs. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we introduce our panelists. We are live and welcome any questions through the comments section on Facebook. We'll answer as many questions as we can in the last few minutes of the session. Um, if you've RSVP'd for the event, you will receive a follow-up email uh, with helpful links and information related to the session. Uh, also with a recorded version for your reference. You can also view the full recording on our website or on our YouTube channel. Today, we are so pleased to bring you our first Park Summit session of 2021, entitled Open Outdoors. During this one hour session, you'll learn how Austin City's Connecting Children to Nature, or CCCN, uh, their collaborative data-driven approach brings together city departments, Austin ISD, and multiple nonprofit and community-based partners to improve children's health and close the nature gaps for the kids who need it most. We'll also talk about what our audience can do as a community to help. Our panelists today are Melody Alcazar, the CCCN Program Coordinator with Austin Parks and Recreation, Ann Moeller, Outdoor Learning Specialist with Austin Independent School District, and Monica Lopez-McGee, Director of Cities and Community Engagement at Children and Nature Network. I just wanna thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and dive in with the questions since we actually have a lot to cover in a pretty short period of time. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, first of all, um, can each of you tell me more about the specific work you do connecting children to nature? Melody, we'll, we'll get started with you. Sure, thanks Kathleen and thanks for having us today. Um, so as CCC and coordinator for Austin um, and being one of the 18 cities in kind of the national cohort, um, we use the systems change framework to really drive home how we as a city can equitably connect children to nature. Um, and within Austin, we have five different strategies um, that we are trying to achieve that goal, um, including green school parks, nature play, outdoor learning environments, which focuses on the zero to five age group, um, youth leadership, um, which is 14 to 24 year olds, and nature smart libraries. Um, and then for those that are a little bit more familiar with some of the um, kind of the early work of our, our CCC and Austin efforts, um, we passed early on the Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights, um, which is always on our website accessible. So you're welcome to sign it if you haven't done so already. Um, and then last but not least, we have our nature equity map. Um, and I thought I would just share that. So um, for those that haven't seen it before, um, you can get an idea on what this looks like. Um, basically, we looked at all sorts of things such as, you know, where children within the city live, um, park access, park quality, tree canopy, all of these things and mashed them all together um, and came up with uh, kind of a framework that identifies area within Austin that are what we consider to be nature deficient. Um, and so through our CCC and Austin efforts, we really are, are honing in on um, trying to focus all of our energies within those areas of town um, that don't have access to nature the way that the rest of Austin does. So again, all of this is on our website. You're welcome to check it out at your, um, at your leisure. We'll send that out at the, after the, the session as well. I thanks Melody and thanks Kathleen for having us here. Um, I'm Ann Muller. I'm the outdoor learning specialist for Austin ISD. I support green schoolyards and outdoor learning. I do that in a variety of ways uh, through curriculum support and professional learning. We have an environmental stewardship advisory committee and I am the chair of the nature um, subcommittee and we have written really robust nature goals for Austin ISD. I do a lot of work on updating our educational specifications, which are the guidelines that um, the district will follow with bond projects, um, new build, um, modernization projects, et cetera, which require outdoor learning features for um, our new projects, which is really exciting. We've done a really thorough assessment of all of the green schoolyard features that each school has so that we can lean in and figuring out where there are gaps, um, where we have highlights in the district and what needs campuses have for support. 
We have a district demonstration habitat garden, Discovery Hill. I'm told you can hear the birds pretty well that are chirping right outside the door where I am. And then we do a lot of collaboration with community partners. So really thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I will, hello, this is Monica and I will echo the sentiment of um, thank you for hosting this space and the invitation to be part of this conversation. Um, my work uh, is national, but I am grateful to be call Austin home. So have the advantage of kind of um, as we work with cities and communities across the nation to be grounded here and in this work that, that we're talking about today. And so at Children and Nature Network, you know, our belief is that <clears throat> equitable access to nature, that in order to influence equitable access to nature, um, we would want to look at the big systems that impact children's lives. Melody was talking about the systems change. What are city policies and programs, schools and early childhood, uh, family access? How do we look at family access? And then what are those nearby green spaces and outdoor experiences as it relates to youth development and incorporating uh, the socio um, the social emotional learning um, so that we can create a new generation of really diverse nature smart leaders and we do this um, by building by investing in a movement and helping to build the case and inspire others and in looking at core systems. We look at achieving this from a gra what we call a grassroots, working with community leaders, community-based organizations across the nation, and also grass tops. So working with municipalities, which is the city's Connecting Children to Nature initiative at the national level that Children Nature Network um, leads in partnership with the National League of Cities. And so we, we will know that each of those communities has unique levers and we wanna tap into both of them and invite them to work collaboratively so that we can grow the movement. Thank you. Uh, that actually is a great segue to our next question, which is what does equitable access to nature mean to you and to the work you do? Um, where do you see the biggest gaps in equitable access and to what do you attribute these gaps? And Monica, I'm gonna start off with you. Yeah, happy to chime in. So, you know, we know that nature is an underutilized, a free resource, but also an underutilized resource that exists in every community to help reduce stress um, and increase resilience for, for children to reach their full potential. But we also know that too often the color of your skin, your zip code, um, and dictate whether you have access to these safe and nearby nature, safe and nearby spaces. So, and we know that this is not an accident. We believe so we have to look at how we start to prioritize our health infrastructure and amenities so that it is no longer about access for a few, but access for everyone and every day because our cities are where we live. 80% of our populations um, live in cities. So how do we ensure that where we live on a regular basis here in Austin, in our communities, that there is safe, um, free access every day so that children can experience, children and families can experience uh, the outdoors with regularity. And I can I just jump in right after Monica, um, you know, from the Austin perspective. So, you know, I'm housed in our parks and rec planning division. And so um, we spent a lot of time looking at kind of how parks are used in different communities, the different amenities that exist in those. And from that kind of parks perspective, what's really interesting is that our school parks actually have a larger disparity in quality compared to the, you know, the other types of parks that are seen within the city. So metro or district or in your neighborhood parks, um, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of reasons around, you know, why we are seeing that right now. Um, this was something that was really called out in the long range plan that we did just, I guess, last year now, time is very fuzzy these days, but I think it was about a year ago. Um, and, you know, Austin has a, a, a large kind of system in place um, that has, you know, some historical inequities that we see across the city, not just within Perk specifically, um, but that I think that definitely plays into why we see some of this. Um, at our school sites, especially, we often see that the kind of the squeakiest wheel gets the most attention. So if you can call a lot of attention to yourself through your school, through the PTA, by calling your council member, et cetera, um, you know, unfortunately that means that those concerns are addressed first. Not that we don't to want to address those concerns, but 
there are many, many other sites that have probably worse problems and those communities may or may not be aware of the avenues in which they can try and receive some of that assistance as well. Um, and then, you know, the fact that we've got 22 joint use sites um, throughout the city and anytime that you're dealing with two bureaucracies like the school district and the city of Austin and then trying to get everyone together to come up with one plan on how to use and manage and maintain that space, um, it can definitely become a bit of a challenge. But um, I think that we as through our CCC and Austin efforts are really working to try and figure out again where those kind of push points are and where can we put our, our resources um, into areas of town that, again, they may not necessarily um, understand what those avenues are, they may not have capacity to be as vocal as other communities can. And so that's really where we're trying to kind of close that gap. Um. Thanks, Melody. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about the specific access that schools can provide in terms of equity. So um, we know that that um, there is an in there is there are inequities in how much time or access. Um, students have here in Austin. The nature equity map that you showed us, Melanie, is a really great example of that. And the assessment of all of the green schoolyard features that we've done um, shows that, that even in these um, more nature deficient parts of town, our schools are also severely lacking um, in some parts of town. And we have other schools that have really robust green schoolyards. And whether you have a robust green schoolyard or not, you can still get outside and take advantage of that space and, and bring learning into, um, into those schoolyards. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to promote in the district is, is taking learning outside. Uh, the infrastructure is secondary to the learning that can happen in those spaces. And so while we tend to focus on that infrastructure. It's something tangible that we can do to improve those spaces. Um, just having the infrastructure doesn't always mean that it gets used. And so that activation piece is really important in supporting campuses and teachers and communities on getting their students outside so that they're making connections, but also um, curriculum connections because learning can happen um, in a classroom just as easily as it can in an outdoor classroom and really should be happening from the sidewalk to the school building and within the school. And so um, we also, um, I just wanted to speak to something that we've done in our Green School Park subcommittee through CCCN, which is that we've created a five minute walk to a nature space map. Um, it's a five minute walk for elementary schools and 10 minute for secondary. Um, field trips that require transportation are not currently permitted in Austin ISD and field trips are a great opportunity to help our students learn more about Austin and the world around them. Um, I taught at a school where I definitely had students who didn't know that there's a river that runs through the middle of Austin and when they have field trips their eyes are opened up to the community that they live in. Um, However, walking field trips are currently allowed. Um, they are COVID approved uh, and a really great opportunity to get kids out. And so that map is just a really nice resource where we've identified nearby nature spaces that are walkable to our elementary and secondary schools and are, are providing a, another opportunity for meaningful connections for our students. Kathleen, uh, just based on what we just heard, I wanted to quickly chime in and say, you know, you're hearing, you know, what does it mean to have access and from Melody and Anne and, you know, my, my um, highlights just want to point out, you know, that we're talking about access in three different facets, the proximity of that green space, you know, is it within a uh, close region, we're hearing from ASD a five minute walk, but also, um, you know, nationally, we look at 10 minute walk, which is a quarter mile. So is do we have do people have access to green space. Um, so proximity. And then what is that walk look like, right? Is that a safe 
um, and, and comfortable um, walk to that space. And then the third aspect is, as Melody was mentioning, what is the quality of that space once you arrive? So as you hear, um, as we share more about progress, you know, those three facets will continue to come out. And we know that it's difficult for cities to acquire more land. So proximity, um, green schoolyards, as we look to open our and form these school park partnerships to open our school grounds, that that is a mechanism to solve that the challenge of proximity because we know it is difficult and expensive to acquire new land. So just wanted to highlight those three aspects that we'll be touching on um, throughout the conversation. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, you know, APF is one of many uh, nonprofit partners that works with um, works on the Green School Parks Committee, and and certainly in our work assessing those sites, you know, you really see the complexity and multifaceted nature of that interaction with the outdoor space. Um, so thank you all for for um, for all these excellent answers. Um, one thing, you know, I think it's we we have a pretty good idea um, of all of the obstacles and all of the things that make it challenging but there's a ton of progress being made. And so I'd love to hear uh, more about, you know, where are we making progress um, from your, your standpoint? And um, tell us about some like recent wins that stick out for you. And uh, we'll start out with you, Anne, please. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, Monica, I, I did wanna just reiterate something you, you brought up there and, and perhaps Melody spoke to this earlier, but um, I think a, a huge thing that is in our favor here with this CCCN work is that the city of Austin and Austin ISD have 22 or so um, joint use properties that are jointly owned between um, the Parks and Rec Department in city of Austin and Austin ISD, which allows a lot of collaboration, particularly on those sites. And so as we talk about um, proximity and, and where our community has access to nature, um, all of our schools can provide that. And in our Green School Park Initiative, we are currently really focusing on those joint use sites um, because both of our entities have an, an, a vested interest in supporting those properties. Um, so along those lines, a couple of wins, well, more than a couple, we have a lot of, a lot of successes going on. It's been um, really exciting. Uh, we have two green school parks open. Uh, one is at Barrington Elementary. That was our first green school park in Austin ISD. The second is at Wildridge Elementary. Uh, both are in the Rundberg neighborhood, which was one of our priority areas based on the uh, nature equity mapping that we did with Melody. And Sanchez Elementary is in the process. They're going through a modernization um, process with the 2017 bond. And we were able to collaborate closely with that bond process um, and their green school park um, process. So when students move back onto that property, they will also have a green school park um, available for use and the community, which is really great. Uh, we have had kind of a win coming out of COVID, obviously um, a, a global pandemic has had a lot of issues, um, but it's helped to spotlight the value of outdoor learning, knowing that the risk of transmission is much lower outside. We've had um, some national attention. We've written a case study for Green Schoolyards America around the work that Austin is doing. We have, thanks to Austin Parks Foundation, um, provided uh, or are in the process of providing stumps, limestone blocks, and mulch for six of our priority schools who did not have any outdoor classroom spaces so that kids and, and classes can get outside safely um, for their learning now. And I spoke to the ed specs earlier, um, but this is a huge win for us. I think we're national leaders around having outdoor learning as a requirement in our educational specifications and uh, have been able, we've actually just revised them from what they were in 2017 to be really explicit. We now have um, really robust um, requirements around gardens and um, green stormwater infrastructure, et cetera. And so knowing that our designers and landscape architects will have to be considering um, outdoor learning spaces as part of these designs uh, really shows the commitment on the district's part to getting students outside and supporting our green schoolyards. And then um, 
An, a new and very exciting one for us is our coordinated school health plan has just expanded to include um, physical environments. And so in the district's definition of whole child, we are now able to say that our physical environment and outdoor learning and sustainability initiatives are a district requirement and um, schools will be scored on that. And so we've been able to collaborate on what that process looks like. And then um, I will will send a link to the Austin case study that I mentioned earlier in the follow up materials. So, so in addition to all of the kind of the green school park stuff that Anne you know really covered, um, I wanted to shift a little bit. And you know we've got five strategies total. We spent a lot of time talking about green school parks just because it's so relevant to kind of what uh, Austin Parks Foundation um, is able to help with and our joint use sites. Um, but we do have other projects happening. Um, and so I think one of the, the coolest things that's about to happen is at, at Walnut Creek Metro, we have our first like official large scale nature play installation getting installed um, right now. Um, the Fairy Pavilion, which was out at last year's Fort Landy exhibit at the Wildflower Center is part of that. So we were really excited to see that um, already getting installed and put together. Um, and then the rest of the nature play features should be installed over the next couple of months. Um, so, it, you know, it's the city's and the parks department's first um, kind of real official installation for nature play. Um, and we've been, you know, doing a lot of work around guidelines and safety and playability and all these concerns that everyone has um, to make sure that as these start to go in to our park system, we've got con consistency around those um, specific requirements and regulations. Um, and I think what's really unique about that project is that, um, so the CCCN initiative as a whole doesn't have any funding directly tied to it. So it's not like we can pull money and say, okay, let's put in nature play. And here's, here's the pool of money that we're pulling that from. Um, and so we're often trying to um, find the connections with other city departments and within our own entities um, to figure out how we can pay for all of this stuff. And, one of the things that we did was apply for a grant through the St. David's Foundation, um, the Parks with Purpose grant, which um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, as many of the APF partners have also applied um, and have received some of that funding as well. Um, but we were able to kind of leverage the funding from our grant to um, allow for a larger installation out at that site because the playground at Walnut Creek Metro is also in the process of being replaced. Um, and so by kind of combining those efforts, um, it's basically two projects happening at one time, which cuts a lot of costs for us, um, which is great. And so we were really excited to see, you know, how we might be able to work with our partners and seek out some additional funding to be able to start to install some of these things. So we're really excited to see that come online. Um, it should be ready May-ish, I say ish, because everything keeps getting pushed back because of COVID, but hopefully this summer, um, everyone will be able to, you know, see that brand new installation. Um, and we are, should be having some associated um, activation programming through the Earth Native Wilderness School um, out at that site this fall. So excited to see that come online and, and get ready and be used by everyone. Yeah, the local examples, um, you might start to think that this is the norm <laughs> in every city. <laughs> so Austin is definitely leading the way in many facets, um, you know, having a dedicated person like Melody and Anne within the city and within the school district, um, you know, makes a significant difference. And so really grateful for those local resources and, and the advancements. And, you know, Austin is one of 18 cities um, that have named equitable access to nature as a priority within their cities. And so I just want to pause and, you know, this is, we've seen a grassroots swelling throughout the years, volunteers within APF and communities um, engaged in outdoor experiences and advancing this. But to think of cities and, and, not, and mayors signing on to say, you know, a, you know, among the many priorities within our cities that we are going, that we see access to the outdoors as a means for solving 
uh, you know, some of our different city problems city challenges. And so in Baltimore, um, they're looking at na um, nature-based interventions for trauma-informed care. So how are, you know, how are they addressing the significance, violence, and trauma that they see in their community with nature-based interventions? Um, in San Antonio, we're seeing, uh, and Austin recently launched this, but a partnership between library and parks. So how is it that we, you know, we, we, we know that parks are critical assets, but how do we also look at other venues as potentials for nature connection, including libraries and forming those partnerships so that we see cross-departmental collaboration. Um, in Houston, Mayor Turner has, you know, this is something that he has 50 for 50. So they are raising dollars so that um, you know, we see some really strong, I know even within APFs, really strong friends groups around parks. And he's saying, how do we take those dollars and distribute them across parks? And he's named 50 parks that will receive those dollars um, and, and distribute equitable, distribute those that fundraising equitably. And so, you know, I just want to highlight that this is really incredible that we're seeing cities place nature connection, especially for our children, especially for those who have less access um, and less as access historically by the systems and the design of our cities, um, step up and see this as a, as a solution for how we navigate our, our cities and, and support our children in academic learning and also the play, right? The, the physical movement and the mental health that comes when we spend time outdoors. Thank you, Monica. It's really uh, very cool to get that sort of national perspective as well, um, because of course we're sort of like so honed in on our on the Austin community. It's great to see how it compares, and great to know that we're doing really well. So I like that. Um, one thing I was wanted to just um, mention before we move on to the next question is that um, last year we got to do that training that. Uh, Melody organized with Adam Bienenstock, and that was, I think, a really great uh, win for um, for every, all the partners who were involved, and also for staff who work at the Parks Department to see the benefits of nature play. And that was a really cool. Um, it was very cold, I will say that, uh, but it was um, really great to see it in action and see sort of how how these playgrounds could be constructed and there, there's such a variety of things that um, that can be very complex to something very simple but you can just really see how um, children you get so much more play value out of the these natural um, playgrounds and loose parts and all these things that um, kids can really use their imagination so that was a really great was that 2020 I think I'm, I'm also having blurred maybe it was 2019 I don't know uh, anyway, moving right along, um, I do want to kind of talk about the challenges that we face. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about sort of the bigger picture um, issues, but also what are the challenges to this work um, that everyone's, um, that they sort of see as the biggest challenges? Um, Melody, let's start with you. Yeah, so I, I think I've mentioned both of these things. Um, you know, we, CCC in Austin has over 150 stakeholders, so folks that just kind of want to stay in the know, um, from about 50 different departments or agencies. So it's a lot of people <laughs> that, um, you know, want to be on the same page, um, but that coordination is challenging. Um, you know, I mentioned the challenges that we have just between the, the school district and the Parks and Rec Department and our joint use sites. Um, you know, that's just one way that we're trying to work together. Um, for anyone that's worked with the city before, um, you know, we can be siloed sometimes. And so we're really trying to work to get out of those silos because as, as Monica has really kind of driven home, nature impacts every part of our life. It impacts transportation, it impacts health, it impacts sustainability and climate change. And all of those things are interconnected. Um, and so it is, it is definitely a challenge that we're trying to overcome and slowly but surely are, are chipping away at, you know, bringing all of those groups together um, towards a common goal. Um, I would say that maintenance is one of our biggest challenges. Um, Monica and I had a, a revolutionary conversation about school gardens several years ago that 
Um, you know, a school garden can often look like a total disaster that's been neglected for who knows how long and the champion has left. And I think the, the power and beauty of school gardens and our green schoolyards is that they're a constant learning opportunity that the community is always coming back to and revitalizing. And so they may be going through cycles, um, but it doesn't mean that that garden is done and didn't have value for the community um, that first put it in or that maintained it along the way or that is going to revitalize it again. And so, um, I think that that mindset has been really important for me. I saw a garden um, just this weekend that I personally did a lot of digging and leading of lessons in with the teachers and students. And um, it doesn't look like it's been touched in six months. And that could be a very depressing, it's probably hasn't been touched in a year <laughs> in all reality with COVID, but um, you know, you could take that as, as a really depressing situation, like a waste of resources. And it's really not because um, the ecosystem, the, the habitat benefits of that space and the learning value that it's provided along the way and the potential value that it still has is, is there. Um, all of that to say that maintenance is still extremely difficult. Um, teachers right now are very much in survival mode, um, physically trying to survive the pandemic and then um, just surviving in their classrooms, trying to um, make sure that our students are thriving. It's just a challenging time. And to add maintenance on top of that um, is, is a big ask right now. Even under normal circumstances, um, I'm sure that, that the community watching right now is pretty familiar with the gardening situation in Austin, but the weeds are very aggressive and um, the sun is very aggressive in the summer, et cetera. And so, you know, I think that there's just a constant need for support um, in, in terms of maintenance. Um, Meaningful activation is a challenge. I spoke to this earlier, but just because you have a beautiful garden or outdoor classroom doesn't mean that our students and teachers are actually using it. And so, you know, I think I lean in a lot on professional learning and trying to support our teachers and principals in getting outside, um, but it's a challenge. It there There's a, a mental model or mindset around green schoolyards that, um, we're slowly chipping away at. Um, you know, a lot of people might think that the schoolyards are just about beautification and there's so much more than beautification. Yes, beautification is important. We all want to live or, and work in spaces um, like this one. I'm so lucky to work at Discovery Hill. Um, uh, but the, the habitat ecosystem value of spaces like this and the curriculum connections that can be made are so important. Um, you know, teachers may think that outdoor learning is more, it's something extra. It's not yet widely um, integrated into the curriculum in Austin ISD. We have outdoor connections in the science curriculum, um, but not in the other core content. And I think we have a lot of teachers who are just not knowledgeable about gardening and they're afraid that if they go into the garden, they're going to get roped into being a gardener and um, and really anything they're doing in the indoor classroom, they can do outside if they're practicing math problems, if they're reading, if they're doing an experiment, if they're learning about different cultures um, around the world, any of those things can be happening in an outdoor space. You don't have to be a content expert about what flowers or plants are around you to have really successful learning happen in those spaces. So, um, you know, some of those mental models are really one of the big hurdles that we're working on addressing and helping teachers to feel just more comfortable in getting out and using those spaces. And, and Melody, I think you touched on many of the, well, every city is different and the solutions for each is unique. And you know, the city's Connecting Children to Nature initiative is not meant to be formulaic. Um, we certainly see some trends across cities and the barriers you named are common in city after city. You know, uh, maintenance, um, 
mindsets that exist, um, policies that hold things, hold thing, um, hold current conditions the way they are. And and I echo back to that <laughs> that conversation we had a few years ago around gardens. And and I continue to believe they're the most resilient because uh, you know a new champion will come along. And, and support that space. Um, you know, I've seen it happen with volunteers, with teachers, with parents, um, even principals that kind of see an opportunity in those garden beds. Um, and to think of how partnerships like the one that we're seeing here in Austin and in across cities with where municipalities and school districts come together to look at how to address green schoolyards and other, you know, other strategies. It then so that those gardens don't have to be as resilient, so that there are systems in place for maintenance and that the, there are resources available, both financial and knowledge-based expertise um, to be able to use those spaces and to curate those spaces in not only the single garden bed, but with you know stormwater infrastructure that shows up and with um, nature play features so that children have more opportunities to jump on logs and, and move about. And so certainly those challenges um, surface creep up <laughs> everywhere. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's the significance of this initiative and, and the work that we're doing so that um, we continue to kind of chip away <laughs> there. Absolutely. Um, with those challenges in mind, um, you know, obviously we need a lot of people to address those challenges. So for our audience today that's tuning in, what do you all feel like is the best way for someone in the community to, to help with these efforts? Melody, I think we'll start with you. Yeah, um, so I, I had mentioned our stakeholders. So I think that that's one of the easiest ways just to stay in touch with what's happening. Um, we provide a quarterly newsletter um, that lets you know what's going on within each of our five strategies. And so that gives you just a better idea on um, how you could potentially start to plug in and connect with all of the different work. Um, we're never in a shortage of, of needing extra hands because um, there's so much to be done. Um, so we definitely encourage you to you know, check in on that. Um, I also had mentioned our Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights um, early on. Um, again, you can still sign this. You don't have to sign it more than once. So if you've signed it already, we've got you covered. Um, but if you have not signed it yet, um, I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, you know, that really shows um, our city leadership that, that we view nature as um, a right, not a privilege. And so all children throughout Austin um, should be able to access nature. Um, and it goes through a laundry list of things that they should be able to do out there. So um, take a peek on our website and you can sign that there. Um, I think specifically for our, um, our folks that are involved in the Adopt-A-Park program, um, advocating for nature in general in your park spaces is a huge way um, that you can really be hands-on directly involved with changing um, how those spaces are used and the infrastructure that's there. Um, so that could be anything from a nature trail to nature play features themselves to um, additional, you know, wildflower meadows, et cetera. So anything that, that connects people within that space to um, nature that is naturally found in that area, um, you know, we have avenues to help you do that. I would like to invite you all to visit our campuses and see the beautiful nature spaces that we do have for inspiration. Um, thank you to uh, St. David's and the City of Austin Watershed Protection Department for an amazing um, set of projects at Riley Elementary. We've got um, really wonderful green stormwater infrastructure with cisterns and berms and swales and rain gardens there, as well as a social emotional learning garden that is um, currently going in. If you are visiting a school campus, make sure to check in um, uh, with appropriate folks at, at the school to make sure that you're following any protocols that they have in terms of COVID safety and access to the school grounds. Um, <clears throat> Definitely encourage you to offer if you are a volunteer or have expertise in maintenance and, and support and um, live near a school campus or um, have identified a campus that you think could need could um, benefit from your help. I know that schools are always always in need of volunteer support and maintenance support with their gardens. 
Uh, once COVID allows, definitely encourage you to lean in in terms of activation, reaching out to campuses to offer um, reading in the garden. If you have education experience and are interested in leading lessons um, or activities on the weekend, definitely using those spaces as community members. Um, particularly with our joint use sites, these are park spaces for you and we want you to use them and invite you to do so. Um, the, we have a lot of campuses where PTAs are um, doing grant writing for their green schoolyards and sometimes need some help and support. So if you have expertise um, or just an interest in helping to support grant writing, I know that PTAs often welcome that help. And then uh, this fall, we'll be starting our garden to cafe program up again, uh, where produce from the gardens um, can be served in the cafeterias. And so definitely keep your eyes and ears open for that. And if schools need help with applying or harvesting um, at, to be able to get produce into the gardens, I think that's a really great way to get involved. Not into the gardens, into the cafeteria. <laughs> Produce is already in the gardens, we hope. <laughs> um, so Anne named quite a few different avenues and I just wanna high, I wanna first start at the national and then zoom in on some of the aspects that Anne named and, and Melanie named and kind of expanding on them. Um, nationally, we have a green schoolyards action agenda. So I invite you to visit, I've dropped some links in the, in the Facebook comments. And so invite you to visit that site, um, it, you know, a chance to learn more. I think knowledge is powerful. So just simply clicking on some of those links, learning more, understanding uh, what is happening and what the opportunity is with Green Schoolyards and signing on there to, to help support that movement. And then locally, you know, continue to advocate and mention PTA and certainly the opportunity for support with grant writing. And we're seeing some really innovative approaches when we think of equity. So in Seattle, their PTA uh, system is looking at what is the opportunity to take a percentage of dollars a month, you know, for each PTA to create a pool of dollars that supports uh, schools that don't have the same fundraising abilities as those as the stronger PTAs, more affluent PTAs. Looking at friends groups, as I mentioned in Houston, how Mayor Turner is looking to raise dollars that distribute across parks. So as friends groups, how do you, you know, what is the opportunity to pull those funds and create a shared dollars. Also, what is the opportunity to, when you're visiting those beautiful other sites that Anne and Melody mentioned, to, you know, consider adopting a space that is our uh, partner space that is out of your immediate community to su support and engage and, and meet other people. Um, so, so those are some of the ways that kind of start to show up to be thinking and understand um, how we can start to think and act more equitably. Also, you know, one of the things that comes that happens when we think of out access to outdoors is you have kind of different camps. <laughs> one is, you know, the first is people saying like, that's not for me. And that's either not for them because they don't associate with the outdoors or that's not for them because they don't see themselves reflected in the outdoors. So helping to change that narrative that nature is not a nice to have, but it's a tool for so many of the different outcomes we've, we've chatted about today. And how do we start to change the narrative um, who, where nature is and who it's for by telling our own stories and asking others about theirs. Thank you all. Um, I wanna add, um, you know, in the summertime, we're trying to work on as, or, as a volunteer driven organization, uh, we're really trying to work on prioritizing places that need that kind of maintenance. So joint use sites in particular um, to kind of channel our volunteers. It's a very hot time to work outdoors, but it can be very rewarding work. And so keep an eye out for the summer for APF volunteer projects, because we will be trying to focus our efforts on some, some schools. Um, I think a couple of years back, we did, we focused in the summer on Barrington because it had this newly installed green school park and we didn't want for it to go into sort of a maintenance slide, you know, during the summer when everybody's gone and not really thinking about it anymore. So we tried to do a couple of projects there and had some local companies um, who were who came out to volunteer and really enjoyed their time there and really felt 
like the projects were super impactful. Um, and one other thing, uh, part of the work that we do is around advocacy. And so, um, you know, we really encourage and try to find pathways for people to speak directly to their council members and say, this is a priority for me, for my community. Um, so if you want to um, sign up for our advocacy um, e-news, um, you can do that through our website. Um, that is a really great way to find out some, some very tangible actions that you can take to say we want to put more funding into green school parks or into green infrastructure, into nature play. Um, and uh, also I personally follow Austin Common and I think that they offer a lot of really good step-by-step um, -step kind of, um, here's how you contact the person, you know, your legislator, here's how you contact someone with AISD, here's how you contact, because it can be very confusing and it works differently at each level. And it's really, everything is working really in concert with each other. So there's things you can advocate for at the city level that might get some sort of pushback at the state level. And so understanding these different avenues can be really challenging, but is still very effective if people are really working together as a community to say, this is something that we want. And we've seen changes happen because people in the community say, this is a priority. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, we'll be sending out resources about how to get involved in that way at the end of uh, this session. So we've kind of reached a point where I would love to open it up to um, commenters on Facebook. So just hold on one second um, while I see if we have any questions. If we don't right now, it's probably because we are extremely informative and <laughs> Everyone knows everything they need to know. But I do have some additional, a couple of additional questions um, that we can use the time for if we don't have anything on Facebook. So I'm gonna check really quick. And it looks like we don't have anything right this minute. So if folks out in the Facebook community um, have a question, now is the time, but I'm gonna start with another question. Um, and then if we have something that comes up after that, then we can address it. And if not, then we can, we'll just wrap up. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about is what is the importance of working with multiple partners to meet nature access goals? So we've kind of alluded to that, that this is a multiple partner sort of, um, you know, city departments, AISD, nonprofit partners, um, but, um, you know, kind of specifically, why is that important? Uh, and Monica, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I think when we, you know, partnerships are, they, they take an early investment, but they're about leveraging the strengths of different organizations and agencies. Um, and so, for example, uh, the Cities Connecting Children to Nature initiative that is led nationally with Children Nature Network, you know, we recognize our strength in the research and the evidence base that exists around nature connection with over 1000 articles curated on our website or related to the benefits of nature. We also recognize that we believe that municipalities hold unique levers for change. And that is not a segment that we typically reach. And so with in partnership with a National League of Cities, who has that membership of cities and network, you know, how that partnership brings together that expertise and that network and supporting each other so that we could launch this initiative. And so I think, you know, our goal is to model it <laughs> um, with, you know, based on our partnership, but then to also illustrate the strength, the advantage and the opportunity that comes with pairing those strengths and seeing how that shows up. We mentioned a few opportunities, library park partnerships, libraries already have programming, um, parks have, the, you know, sometimes these outdoor spaces, they're ne sometimes neighboring each other. Those are joint lots. So how those library park partnerships, we can work together. Um, watershed and water utility companies often have dollars related to management of stormwater. And so we see that across the nation. How do we allocate those resources so that when we're building in stormwater infrastructure, we can ensure that it has um, natural elements that can engage uh, children and families in, in exploration 
And so um, health departments, so we know that access to nature um, improves our mental and physical health. And so looking at partnerships with health departments who one of the things that help, uh, they show up with is an immense amount of data of understanding um, how their communities are affected. And so building partnerships there to to use that data to help inform decision making. Those are just a few, but um, certainly, you know, the opportunity exists to continue to build different types of partnerships and some that we have have yet to imagine so that we can push uh, and move new levers. And Melody, I know that Austin ha is, has many of these examples. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I was just thinking, I when I think about partnerships, there's this graphic that I sometimes refer to that we put together years ago, um, specific to Woldridge when we built out the Woldridge Green School Park. And um, on it, it shows all of the different entities that were involved in developing that site. And so if you think about the work that was done, um, we had over a hundred trees put in and a bunch of nature play um, installation features go in. And so that was, in partnership with our urban forestry department, which is out of development services division, um, which to me feels like a misnomer, but, um, and then uh, they also moved the fence line so that the school has access to, there's a, actually a creek that runs right next to the campus. And so the fence line was pushed to the opposite side of that creek so that the school can now get access to that space during school time. So if they want to go in there and use that space for lessons, they're able to. Um, the track itself has a lot of runoff when it rains. Um, and so we worked with our watershed protection department to um, extend that fence line to provide access to the creek and also add in some berms and swales and a wildflower meadow, and uh, which also acts as a, um, a rain garden, basically it's like a three in one, <laughs> um, to help prevent the runoff of the track. Um, when we think about um, the different park amenities that are there generally, you know, you've got signage, you've got waste receptacles, you've got benches, picnic tables, et cetera. Parks department had to come in and say, okay, well, what can we manage that's outside of what we're already doing? What do we have capacity for um, adding in those specific features? Um, if you think about how people are getting that space. So are we working with our transportation department on, um, you know, is the sidewalk around that area still usable? Can we partner with Safe Routes to School to make sure that people can get there by, wike, by walking, by biking. Um, Wildridge, if you're familiar with it, um, is in the middle of a neighborhood. And so a lot of those schools are walking or biking to that school in order to get there. Um, and so it just gives you an idea on like all of the groups, like yes, it's under the umbrella of CCCN, um, but we're constantly working with all of these different departments and agencies to um, come up with a vision that meets everybody's goals um, while still providing a space that is very usable for the community and the school. Um, I think that Monica and Melody covered this question really well. So I actually wanted to add an invitation in, um, which, which is kind of like the last question of what you all can do to support this work. But there are a lot of opportunities for you all to join us in the work and the conversation. Um, Texas Children in Nature is a statewide collaborative um, that is a great opportunity to get together with um, leaders from around the state in terms of connecting children to nature. We have a local um, version, the Children in Nature Collaborative of Austin, which uh, is through West Cave Outdoor Discovery Center. Um, obviously, joining our city's Connecting Children to Nature uh, work, we have lots of subcommittees and then um, quarterly stakeholder meetings and invite you to join those stakeholder meetings and um, become a part of the work with us. And then uh, the Central Texas School Garden Collaborative is another network opportunity. And Austin ISD has the Environmental Stewardship Advisory Committee that if you aren't interested in joining, you can still um, attend those meetings to be uh, part of or to, to be kept up on what's going on in Austin ISD around sustainability initiatives. And um, you can always join our subcommittees there as well if you're interested. Yeah, I would definitely say that um observing sort of and being part of these meetings you know there's a lot of people involved and I, I, I think it can be challenging 
to get everyone on the same page all the time. It's a lot of communication, a lot of people that have big jobs and are doing a lot of other things too. But it's amazing when you're trying to solve a particular, maybe even just sort of a small problem, there's always someone who can say, oh, I have a resource for that. Or, oh, I know a person who knows a person who has a resource for that. And so just the nature of being able to really work together and bring everyone sort of strengths and things they're already doing. And I think, you know, a theme that I'm see, hearing a lot that I hadn't really thought about so much before is just trying to re conserve resources as much as possible. So if you're doing this thing, weave this other thing into it. Um, you know, so if you're working on a watershed project, how do we weave in nature play into that? How do we make sure that we're um, not trying to do five different projects um, in a row, but sort of do them together. So that's certainly the benefit of everyone working together. Um, we're right at time actually. So um, I just wanna thank everyone on our panel for being here today and lending us your time and expertise. It was a great conversation. Um, for those who are tuning in, you can watch or, or, and wanna share this or watch the recorded version. It'll be on austinparks.org slash parks dash summit. We also will be taking this session and all of our sessions and converting them into a park a podcast for people who like podcasts. Um, and it's called the Austin Parks Cast. You can find it on Spotify, um, Apple, lots of other platforms I don't know anything about. So, um, so please tune in. We also have um, our season uh, what we're calling season one, which is all of our wonderful sessions that happened last year that we've uh, made into a podcast. So listen in for anything you might have missed or want to revisit and um, stay tuned for future sessions. Thank you all again. <laughs>